So, uh, I, I say thanks very much for inviting me, Masatoshi. It's great uh, uh, to be able to help, actually, which is that's my goal today. It's not particularly to put forward my own theories of consciousness, but to try to make sure uh, that by the end of it, the, particularly the scientists among you who have maybe not done much philosophy before, have some better uh, understanding of how philosophers are approaching the problems or what kind of problems they're approaching. So that when you talk to a philosopher, you somewhat uh, know a bit more about what they're thinking. Uh, that's my goal at the end. The problem partly is that I have no idea how much you already know about uh, philosophy and philosophical problems and approaches to consciousness. So that's partly why I wanted to have a, uh, make it interactive. So perhaps at some point I might just uh, uh, stop and uh, let you collect your thoughts and think about anything that you just didn't get from what I said and I can uh, go over it again in a different way. Because uh, uh, the important thing is your understanding. Okay, so um, <coughs> I guess I thought I would start from the basic what is philosophy question. and. Everything I, I say from now, for any philosophers in the room, is going to be very controversial and probably wrong from their perspective. <laughs> the question of what is philosophy, uh, uh, there are a lot of people have a lot of ideas about, about what philosophy is or should be, and uh, none of them are basically generally accepted. But there are some common things that uh, people will often agree with. So I'll give you some of those, just as a, a way into how philosophers are often thinking about what they're doing. Um, and so here, and in this way, I'm talking about philosophers in the most general sense, not uh, people doing philosophy of consciousness particularly. I'll start, because I'll start generally. So here's one of them. Uh, this is, this is going to strike you as very vague and unhelpful. Um, but I'll read it anyway, because a lot of philosophers will say that this, is, uh, this uh, accords with how they're, uh, how they're imagining what they're doing. Uh, so, uh, Lucrit Sellers in 1962 said this, that the aim of philosophy, abstractly formulated, is to understand how things, in the broadest how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broad broadest possible sense of the term. And that's not going to be very helpful to you, but it's, uh, somehow for a lot of philosophers it helps them understand what they're doing. Uh, another thing, though, that, uh, that Sellers is famous for putting forward as the aim of philosophy is the reconciliation of what he called the scientific image with the manifest image. And what he meant by that is that uh, so through science we build up a, a picture, a model if you like, of how the world is. But we already have a, a picture of how the world is that we, we get from day to day experience and interacting with others and talking about things. We have in our own minds, a, 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 and perceiving for that matter, we have a uh, uh, we have a, uh, a sense which is just manifest to us in daily life of what the world is like. Then we have this picture that we get from science about what the, what the world is like. And part of the job of philosophy, or the main job of philosophy, according to Sellers, is to make these two somehow uh, fit together into one package, if you like. So to reconcile the, so the scientific image with the manifest image is one uh, task of philosophy that a lot of people would a lot of philosophers, I think, would uh, agree with. But here's another one. This is one I kind of like uh, as well. And it's uh, Wittgenstein has this had this idea. Uh, he is often quoted that a philosophical problem has the form "I don't know my way about," and that the, the as a, as a consequence of that, the his, his analogy of what a philosophy philosopher is doing is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. <coughs> And what he, it's a very enigmatic thing to say as well, but the thing he, what he meant, uh, and what a lot, of, uh, a lot of philosophers thought at, around that time particularly, is that um, uh, philosophical problems arise because in some way we've gotten ourselves confused. Uh, we, whether it's from uh, um, a confusion in the language, a confusion in uh, some uh, some wrong turn we make in our thinking that we just keep making and it just leads us to the wrong direction. Somehow or other, philosophical problems are confusions. 
uh, we were just kind of lost in our own thoughts somehow. So the, the, the task of a philosopher then is to just try to untangle things uh, so that you can see it a little bit more clearly. And once you've done that, then the idea is you no longer have a philosophical problem anymore. Uh, it's either obvious what the solution is, or perhaps in some way uh, it's going to be just a, a, an, easy, an easy problem by which, uh, in Chalmers' sense, meaning uh, a, an empirical problem that you can just figure out by doing the experiment or whatever. So that's um, one way that I kind of like. Uh, so philosophical problems are just ways that we've confused ourselves. Uh, and a bit earlier than that, you get uh, John Stuart Mill. This is a quote I like, and it was the it was a, a, at the beginning of my PhD thesis, actually. Um, and Mill says that language is, is, as it were, the atmosphere of philosophical investigation, which must be made transparent before anything can be seen through it to the few, true figure and position. The idea is that, so within philosophy, you often find that uh, we're, we're talking about words and concepts. And the idea is that it's, the, it's these words and concepts in a way which are tricking us, and we need to get clear about what we're talking about. And that can be often getting clear about how we're talking about something. And once we've figured that out, then we can go on and solve the problem. But we often find that at a certain point, we stop and start talking about the language. Um, and that's, uh, that's another way, or a related way of talking about philosophy. This is a lot earlier than that, 1874, whereas um, Wittgenstein is more or less 80 years after this. But anyway, that uh, hopefully gives you some sense of how philosophers are thinking about philosophy. Um, it's definitely not the only way of thinking about philosophy. And there, as I say, probably for each philosopher in the room, in this room, there'll be a very different way of thinking about what philosophy is. Um, but that will give you that gives you some sense. Um, so this is a, a more difficult part of the, the tutorial. I thought I would give you a sense of how this was done in a kind of technical way 100 years ago or so. Um, we had the beginnings of what's often called the linguistic turn in philosophy. And it starts with uh, Bertrand Russell, or, or at least it starts with, uh, actually before that, with uh, Gottlob Frege. But Russell wrote a paper that uh, did, tend, did change the way that people are thinking about how to solve a, how to approach a philosophical problem in terms of the language that's used to, to uh, in terms of the problem being the language. And uh, I'll just go through this example, and I, I'm not sure that uh, it will um, get the point across. But let me just uh, let me just give the example. So there was a problem in uh, philosophy. It, the problem was of terms that refer to things like, uh, in this case, the King of France, the present King of France. Um, and Russell had a problem. There was a problem with this sentence. The present King of France is bald. Uh, the problem is that there is no king in France. France doesn't have a king. So what does this, what does this refer to? The phrase. And uh, there was a big problem about this because if you say it refers to, well, nothing, it's kind of an empty set, right? But if that's what the word means, then everything that refers to, that everything which refers to something that doesn't exist means the same thing. So it can't be that the meaning is this empty set. It's got to mean something, it's got to pick out something. So people were uh, coming up with all kinds of kind of metaphysical ideas about what this could be that, that the present king of France, what the word refers to, is it like, like uh, including, for example, uh, that the present king of France doesn't actually exist, but he exists as a kind of possibility. So the possible king of France or something, or well, the king of France uh, has some kind of reality in order for us to talk about him, but doesn't actually exist. People were getting really in knots trying to solve this problem. And Russell's solution was kind of ingenious. It's in a paper called On Denoting. And he said, well, maybe what's going on here is that the present king of France is actually a shortened version of uh, a long 
longer expression. And when we say the present king of France is bald, we're actually saying a couple of things in here. And one of them is that there is a king of France, and the other is that uh, um, that person is bald. Um, oh, I, actually, I, I didn't mean to go so fast. Let me go back one further step. <laughs> but the other problem with this sentence, the present king of France is bald, uh, is that it doesn't, it doesn't clearly have a truth value. This was important to, particularly to uh, people in a logical frame of mind for whom everything, every sentence like this has got to be true or false, there aren't any in betweens. Uh, so this was also a problem. The king, present king of France is it true or false? Well, it's obviously not true, but, true, but it's not false either because it just isn't such a person. So this was another problem they were trying to solve. So Russell's solution was that, well, this sentence, the present king of France is bald, is uh, it's kind of a shortened way of saying something much longer, and if you kind of analyze what's, what's being said in this sentence, you get something like, uh, something like this, something like this. So there is currently a king in France, and that person is bald. And now we have a sentence that's just clearly false. There isn't, because there isn't a king in France. I'm just saying something false. And there's no problem of referring to uh, a non-existent entity. You're just postulating something. Right? So, uh, so Russell's, uh, the, the, the Russell is, was very, very proud of this, of this solution, and this uh, became one of the classics in analytic philosophy. And it started a, a, a trend. And the trend was to try to solve problems in this kind of way by thinking of the, the problem as uh, not inherent in the topic itself, in a sense, but not caused by some complexity in the world, but rather the problem is caused by a complexity with our not understanding the complexity of our own, uh, what we're saying, of our own language. So this is, in a sense, the beginning of analytic philosophy. And so people went on to do this, this kind of thing, this kind of thing meaning to try to figure out a solution to a problem in terms of trying to understand what we're saying and untangle that. Um, and uh, the style of analysis changed Russell, in Russell's time, it was very much uh, making, uh, transforming a sentence into logical form and predicate calculus and that kind of thing, but that's not the only way to do it. Uh, still, you will find people trying to figure out first what is the, maybe the, the, maybe the, the problem here is not with the, uh, the phenomenon, maybe it's with the way that we're talking about the phenom phenomenon, the way that we're thinking about it, and we're confusing ourselves uh, because we usually have to use language even to think about things, right? So anyway, I don't know how clear that is, but I wanted to give you a sense of uh, how uh, philosophy has been done and uh, kind of the change, the change that the linguistic term brought about into thinking of things in a much more linguistic way. Okay, so that's a sense of what is philosophy. Philosophy. It's a very simplistic and one-sided sense, but I hope that gives you some idea for those of you who this is new to. The methodology. Philosophers always have a problem with methodology on grant forms, where you'll be asked, "What is the, you know, what's the methodology for a study?" As a philosopher, my inclination to say is to say something like, um, "Well, I'm, I'm going to think a lot." <laughs> And <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to solve this problem. Um, and that's, that's, in a way, what we're, we're taught to say, that philosophers don't tend to have be taught that there is a methodology of philosophy. There are just problems. And however you can solve the problem, solve it. Um, and nevertheless, you can, pick out, uh, you can pick out some common, let's say, strategies that uh, philosophers will use and I don't think these are things that are done only in philosophy, but there are things that, in some ways, as a group, characterize how philosophers go about things. Um, yes, and you, you, you will see some people, some philosophers, um, defending the idea of a methodology which is unique to philosophy, which is particular to philosophy. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true, but certainly, there, as a group, uh, you can find, uh, as a kind of cluster of things that people do to solve problems. Uh, you will find something like this. Um, 
Now let me just go through them. So at the top you've got, of course, logic and reasoning, uh, including uh, everything from uh, Aristotle's original studies into syllogism. Syllogism as in A, uh, if A then B, A therefore B. This kind of simple uh, syllogism is something that Aristotle uh, um, wrote about. And there are lots of patterns like that that were um, uh, described. But then much more recently you have the logic both formal and informal logic, which are of course part of the methodology of not just philosophy, but uh, of course um, uh, logic is now its own field in a sense, and it's debatable whether it's, in some ways, whether it's philosophy anymore. Uh, so the, the other one is fallacy spotting. <laughs> uh, so, so a fallacy is a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a kind of reasoning which is intuitive, but also uh, wrong. So there are lots of fallacies, actually. Um, not all of them are you know, philosophical fallacies. But uh, so here's a, a, a famous fallacy of, uh, let's say, um, uh, it's called affirming the consequence. So the syllogism I just gave you, uh, if A then B, A therefore B, so it's kind of natural for people to make the following reasoning. Uh, if A then B, B, therefore A. It's a kind of uh, natural way for people to, to reason, but uh, it's known to be, it's obviously not valid, right? Um, uh, so that's a, a famous a fallacy, but there are other fallacies that are not just, um, so here's a, I guess you'll call it a, uh, probabilistic fallacy is not a particularly philosophical one. Do you know that you must know that the, the gambler's fallacy, which is the uh, if I if I'm doing roulette and I roll, you know, red ten times. If you ask me what's the probability that the next one will be red, I'm going to say, well, it's, it can't be even. It's got to be more probable that the next one is going to be black. That's obviously a fallacy. But it's not particularly a philosopher's fallacy, but it's a it's, a, it's an intuitive way that people naturally think that we also know on reflection that it's the wrong way to think. So fallacy uh, spotting is one thing that philosophers do, have done, which is why you'll see uh, philosophy departments, oh, this is not showing. Uh, philosophy departments, I'm going to just try to show you this. So, yeah, if you can see, this, uh, this is the, just the Department of Philosophy in College in Texas, and they'll have, um, they, they'll have helped their students lists of fallacies. This is, in a way, what philosophy departments teach their students. Lists of, or in, in, at one point, <laughs> they'll teach them a whole bunch of fallacies to look out for. Um, so fallacies is another kind of method that is common. I feel like fallacy spotting. So clarification of language is another thing uh, that philosophers are known to do a lot. And by that I mean disambiguation. And as you, uh, the, the, in studying consciousness, you've m probably come across various uh, um, um, places where people disambiguate the word consciousness into two, three, four, five different kinds of consciousness, different things that consciousness could mean, the state consciousness, the creature consciousness, and so on, phenomenal consciousness, and so on. So, um, um, making clear all the different possible things you could mean when you say a word. Um, and that's important partly because of, uh, it helps. There is a fallacy known as the fallacy of equivocation, where you have an argument where in, in the premise you use the word in one way, in the conclusion you use the word in another way, that's, that is to say with another meaning. And that kind of reasoning doesn't work, so it's very important uh, for to spot when that's happening. And so getting clear on which, which disambiguation of a word you're, you're using is important. 
So philosophers are often known for making these distinctions. Sometimes it feels like it gets too much, there are too many distinctions being drawn, but of course it's an important thing to be aware of. The other thing um, is conceptual analysis. Uh, there are some people who, some philosophers who, who have argued that conceptual analysis is the method of philosophy. Um, and they'll give you examples uh, such as the, the study of knowledge. So the study of, of what knowledge is, is often thought to be the study of the concept knowledge or the clarifying what we, uh, what, what knowledge is, is uh, what, we, what we mean by knowledge in some way. And the famous uh, analysis that's often given as a kind of success case is the idea that knowledge, what knowledge is, is, uh, is a justified true belief. So we say that you know something if you believe it and it's true and you're justified in believing it. And these three things are necessary and sufficient. O often, at least uh, nowadays, uh, that is a lot more complicated, but this is taken as one of the kind of success cases of, of philosophy um, doing its kind of core task of letting it, of uh, finding out, of discovering in some way what knowledge is by analyzing the concept of knowledge. And the final one, I'll talk about as thought experiments as a, uh, as a method. And, or sometimes people talk about this as the method of possible cases, or something like that. So you get, uh, uh, and very often these, all of these will go together. So for example, you know, opposition to the idea that justified, the belief that knowledge is justified true belief, uh, somebody will uh, give you at some point probably what's known as the Gettier case. And uh, the Gettier case is an example of somebody who's uh, justified in believing something and it's true, but they don't know it. So an example would be uh, that we would normally say, you're looking at the clock over there, and you'd be justified in believing that it's close to 10 o'clock. But it could be that, uh, let, let's say, that that clock is actually broken. You just noticed it now um, and happens to be stopped at 10 o'clock. But that is the right time. Um, in that case, you would have a true belief that would be justified, but you wouldn't know that it's 10 o'clock because it's just lucky that it happened to look over at the clock on that uh, time that it's showing the true time, even though it's broken. So thought experiments are one way that we um, that one thing that philosophers do a lot, you'll be probably aware of uh, Mary, the Mary the Neuroscientist thought experiment. And can I just get us a sense of who does, probably everybody, but maybe not. Is there anyone who, does, who hasn't, uh, doesn't know the Mary the Neuroscientist thought experiment? Can I get a sense? Oh, okay. Well, I'll definitely go through it then in more detail later on. I'll start at the beginning later on. Okay, so uh, you'll be introduced to this thought experiment later on. So, as I was saying, so it's not necessarily that all these methods are purely philosophical methods. All of them you will use in some way in other, in other fields. But as a kind of a group, in some way they uh, characterize, I think, what philosophers do. Okay, so that's philosophical methodology. Um, so before I get on to the consciousness part of this, and I realized I thought I was wondering whether I'd have enough time, but I've only got uh, this far, and it's already half an hour. So I wanted to give you just my quick take on this. Uh, that in, that my, the way that I think about philosophy is something like, um, the, the avoidance of what I'll just call a, a thought trap. Uh, so this can be a fallacy, but I'll just call it a, a thought trap is a train of thought or reasoning that we ought to avoid, but for some reason we find intuitive and we keep falling into it. Uh, and, and philosophy is the task of finding and uh, making clear these thought traps. Uh, 
Um, it's kind of a negative conception, but it can involve positive theories of why we do this, you know, why, why this kind of reasoning is so attractive to us. Um, otherwise, it's kind of a negative conception. So in that sense, a question like what is consciousness isn't, isn't a philosophical question, but it can become a philosophical question um, if we suspect that the answers to it are falling prey to some kind of uh, thought trap, I'll just call it. <laughs> there are some kind of, uh, whether it's a, uh, uh, whether it's a, uh, uh, whether it's a, a kind of ambiguity that we're going one way at some point and another way on the ambiguity that, uh, which is making us come to a, a mixed conclusion on something or whether it's an outright fallacy that we're making um, or whatever, uh, it become, things become a philosophical question when it's, we suspect that somehow our, our thinking on this uh, problem is somehow confused and we have to uh, fix our thinking about it. At least, okay, I'm not going to subject you to any more of my takes on things, but uh, I thought I would at least give that much. Now, and of course, that sort of thing is not particularly uh, uh, the sole responsibility of uh, an academic philosopher or, or a philosopher. Basically, it's everyone's responsibility not to uh, fall into thought traps. But uh, it's just that's, that's what philosophers do that, as their main job. Um, and that's what distinguishes philosophers. Um, but philosophy is whenever you're doing this. So in that sense, uh, um, you're all doing philosophy at some point of your day when you're trying to think things through, just think it through more clearly. Um, okay, so now I thought I would kind of apply these um, or show you how these are or have been applied to problems in philosophy of mind and particularly of consciousness. Uh, so let me go through these. I actually couldn't think of one for logic or reasoning, a logical uh, approach to the problem of consciousness or mind. There probably is one, and I just don't know of it. Does anyone else does anyone know logical, <laughs> a, logical, a logical approach to the problem of consciousness? I forgot to mention at the beginning that if you're, a, uh, if you're another philosopher in this audience, I automatically think of you as my fellow tutor in this uh, tutorial. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, anyway, I couldn't think of that. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll call this a fallacy. Maybe not everybody calls it a fallacy, but it's the, um, this is a brilliant one. Uh, Riles, Riles kind of dismantling of, a fa of a, an argument by Descartes. I'll give you the argument first. I don't know if you've come across it, but it's a really strong argument. So here it is. Anything that's physical has dimensions. Uh, it's extended, is actually what Descartes would say. Anything that's physical has some dimensions. You know, it has a width. Uh, that's what defines being physical in a certain sense. F being physical means having dimensions. Uh, this is Descartes, so we're talking uh, about 400 years ago. And um, the mind doesn't have dimensions. There's no real answer if I ask you how, how wide is your mind? You know, where is the center of it? <laughs> it just doesn't have dimensions in that sense. Um, and therefore, the mind isn't a physical object. That's, the, that's uh, one of Descartes' key arguments that the mind can't be physical. And it's a good argument. Um, and it really convinced people, or helped to convince people for hundreds of years. Uh, it's very simple. Anything, physical objects all have some dimensions. The mind doesn't have dimensions, isn't extended. Therefore, the mind isn't a physical object. It's a very simple, kind of, very simple argument, and uh, um, so I don't know if anyone uh, knows the Riles, Riles, Gilbert Riles solution to this. So this is a this is Riles' uh, famous um, um, so solution. He he accused, accused is probably the wrong term, but he. 
he wrote that Descartes is guilty of what he called a category mistake. Um, and category mistake is, well, I'll, here's the, here's Gilbert Ryle's uh, 1950 uh, answer to this, answer to Descartes' argument. Basically, Ryle says, uh, he agrees as far as uh, that uh, the mind can't be a physical object. The mind can't be a physical thing because physical things have dimensions and the mind doesn't have dimensions. So, uh, Ryle agrees up until this point. But then he says, well, there, but there are two ways of not being a physical thing. Uh, one way is to be a non-physical thing, but the other way is not to be a thing at all. And Ryle's argument was that. So the mind is not a thing. And this was what he called uh, Descartes' category mistake. He put it into the wrong mind, into the wrong ontological category. Minds are not things. They are something else. And of course, as, as you may know, Ryle is famous for his behavioristic theory of the mind. The mind is uh, what we do, how, how things function. It's, it's a kind of event, if you like. It's not a thing, not, a, not an object. Uh, and therefore, not a physical object. So, this was Ryle's uh, category mistake argument. A kind of um, uh, against dualism. Um, so, I thought I'd give another example of a, a, a fallacy. Again, I'm not totally sure everyone would call this a fallacy. But um, yeah, the idea is this, and this comes up in um, especially discussions about consciousness. Here's the, the intuitive uh, idea. It's that, well, if I'm aware of something, then there's got to be something that I'm aware of which easily translates to, you know, if I'm aware of something, then there exists, there, there is, something I'm aware of. This is a really intuitive um, thing to think, because it feels like it's just a slight grammatical uh, change in the sentence, right? It doesn't feel like you're really changing uh, the first and the last um, things being said at all. So, but there is a fallacy here that's been pointed out uh, uh, early, earliest, I suppose, by Brentano. And the idea is, <coughs> uh, so, well, uh, before I point out the, uh, the fallacy, this, is, uh, this comes about in discussions of consciousness because people very often go from, I'm aware of a red sensation, and therefore, there is a red sensation that I'm aware of. And so it's very intuitive, right? It feels like, how could this uh, fail to be true? So, oh, I haven't put the solution to the problem. <laughs> so, the, 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 um, so Brent, the, this originally Brentano uh, in, in the 1800s, um, when he's talking about intentionality, being aware of something, then the idea was that you can be aware of something and there be nothing that you're aware of. And that's, that's often the case when you're dreaming, you're hallucinating, you're thinking just of a, of a thinking of a golden mountain. <laughs> it doesn't mean that there's a golden mountain. Uh, intentionality, being aware of, has that feature. Uh, you can be aware of something that doesn't exist. So in that case, it's just not true that if I'm aware of something, then there is something that I'm aware of. <coughs> those, two, those two things mean something different. And that's something to be aware of. And that <coughs> people like, <coughs> sorry, people uh, like Dennett will often um, uh, emphasize this in his uh, arguments about consciousness. <coughs> we can be aware of, just because we're aware of, <coughs> Um, a phenomenon, a, a quality, let's say, doesn't mean that there is a quality, but there is something that has those features that we're aware of. Okay, so 
this ambiguation, I'm not even going to go into this really, except because you're probably, uh, you've probably read many places where they disambiguate the word consciousness. And uh, it's, it's useful and it's necessary, even if it seems sort of pedantic sometimes. The idea of conscious, the, the, the basic distinction between the idea of uh, creature consciousness, the idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a whole animal being conscious, as opposed to the idea of some state within that animal being conscious, you know, a belief being conscious, or a, as opposed to unconscious, or uh, you know, a, 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 um, a desire being conscious or unconscious. So that kind of distinction is a really useful distinction, um, um, which I guess philosophers have made. But if if there's some scientist who made this distinction, then they were in their philosophical mode when they made it. So it doesn't matter for my purposes. Okay, so um, conceptual analysis is a, um, this has come up in, uh, as a kind of controversial um, method in philosophy in some ways, but here is where it uh, first um, appeared really strongly, I guess, uh, in the idea of pain being a brain state. And before I get to the pain case, I'll go through the what's regarded uh, in some quarters at least as a much more obvious case of, of water. So you want to ask, well, what is water? The first thing that you need to do is to ask yourself, well, what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by water? And <clears throat> as long, you'll need a clear answer to that before you can actually go and do your studies about uh, what water is. But that'll then give you the answer. So if water is, if I ask you what is water, well, it's the stuff you know, in this cup, rains comes out of the rains water. Water comes out of the tap. It's in the seas. Um, it's wet, um, and so on. If 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 that's the answer you give, when someone just asks asks you what is water, meaning in a way, what do you mean by water? Uh, firstly, you give an answer to that, and then a person can then uh, go well. So you mean like the stuff in this cup? Then they'll. Um, you say yes, they'll say, okay, let's go and study what that is. And they'll discover that what's in that cup is just a bunch of H2O molecules. And then, then you'll know that water is H2O molecules. That's the idea of beginning by some kind of conceptual analysis and connecting that to uh, empirical research. That um, um, this kind of way of um, proceeding is sometimes known as uh, um, the camera plan. That in, in all cases, this is how we figure out what there is and its nature. So, in the case of sensation of red, the, this was done to by uh, J. J. C. Smart in a paper in 1959 called "Sensations and Brain Processes," and he applied this kind of answer to what is uh, what is a sensation of red and. It's a bit unlike water in the sense that you can't uh, give it to somebody to study <laughs> uh, um, because uh, it seems sort of it has this kind of private element. But Jack Smart uh, <clears throat> thought, well, there is a sense in which we do mean something when, and you can ex you can explain what you mean when someone asks you what's a what's a sensation of red. You know, you can tell them, well, it's the you know it's this it's the the state that you're in when uh, you know if someone uh, shoves a tomato before your eyes, or uh, you know you're seeing blood, or um, you're seeing uh, maybe even you know, that red folder, or that folder over there. Here, <laughs> the state you're in, <laughs> the state when, when the state when we're in, when we look at things that we agree are red, uh, that's what it is. That's what a red sensation is. And then that the idea was this gives you then. Uh, um, something to hold on to that you can then study. So then all we have to do is figure out, well, what state are people in when they look at red things? Once we figure that out, then we figure out uh, what, is the, what, is, what is to be a red sensation. So <clears throat> this, is a, this is known as the, the topic-neutral approach. 
which resulted in the identity theory of mind brain. So Jackson basically wanted to say that for mental predicates, we this is how we can uh, we don't have to um, uh, we can we can, we can discover that there are brain processes in this kind of way. Um, at the same time, people were, uh, this is just after Ryle published his category mistake um, argument. So, in that sense, these are something of a piece. Um, so, right, but it's not the end of the story because uh, there are now particularly a lot of people who will deny that red sensation means that. So that's not what we mean by a red sensation. That it means something a little bit different, maybe something more like just, you know, this, <laughs> looking at a red object and it's this feeling, <laughs> or something like this. So, uh, and if that's true, it might be more difficult to do this um, uh, method. But that's the idea, um, and you'll see people still arguing for uh, this kind of way. That, in fact, I argued for this in my PhD thesis, but that's a whole other story. Um, right, thought experiments. Okay, so for those of you who don't know the, the Mary the Scientist thought experiment, this is where I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on, the, uh, on what it is. So, the, oh, maybe I'll stop there because the Mary the Neuroscientist is going to take a little, a little while. It's an important thought experiment to keep in mind, but it's going to take a little while to do so. Maybe I'll ask if anyone has any questions. I know it's difficult to ask them in this environment, but if you have any, feel free. Clarification then. Okay, that's fine. So in that case, uh, let me go. Let me, let me go on. So, um, but I, I do want to make sure that I don't um, uh, just end up by confusing everybody. So, if there are things that you want me just to go over, or that, then please, at some point, uh, feel free to go up to that mic and just ask me to say something in more detail. Um, okay. So, Mary, the, Mary, the neuroscientist. So here's a thought experiment that uh, is fantastically uh, influential in uh, philosophy of, uh, of mind. And I suppose in some way, well, in philosophy of mind at least. The idea is this. Um, and the conclusion of the argument is going to be that Mary the Neuros, that, uh, that, that phenomenal consciousness, or consciousness, let's say, is not physical. That's the, going to be the conclusion. So it's a, it has to be a, a fairly powerful thought experiment to get you to believe that, right? So here, here, here goes. So we imagine that there is a, a neuroscientist. We, just, we, call, we call her Mary. She was called Mary. And this neuroscientist uh, has um, has come to know everything that there is to know about how the brain works and how it functions. And I guess we also imagine she knows everything about integrated information uh, theory. She knows everything about there is to know about the, the functioning of the brain and how to describe it. And she knows how color perception works. Um, but she's never actually seen in color, it turns out. So she's just spent her whole life in a black and white room, uh, not able to see color. So, so just as an aside, you're probably going to say this point, but if she's never seen color, probably she wouldn't be able to suddenly see color, right? <laughs> but we ignore that. Uh, uh, she, uh, she happens never to have seen color, but she has the ability to see color. <laughs> and she just never seen red, and she's just never seen anything color. <clears throat> but she knows how color vision works. Uh, to the molecule. Okay, so one day she goes out of her black and white environment and she suddenly uh, sees a, whatever, a red post box. 
and she has a red experience for the first time ever. And we're asked, so does she learn anything? At that, at that moment that she sees a red thing for the first time, does she learn anything? And the, the answer we're encouraged to give, or that, that Frank Jackson, whose argument that, that this is, thought he, he uh, thought it was obvious, and many people think it's obvious, that um, she does. She learns what a red experience is like, what it's like to have a red experience. She didn't know that before, and now she knows it. Therefore, she learns something. There's some fact about the universe that she didn't know and now she knows. Namely, you know, what it's actually like to have a red experience. So, if there's some fact that she now knows that she didn't know before, but she knew all the physical facts, you know, down to the molecules, she knew all that. So that means that what it's like to have a red experience is a different fact from all those physical facts. So that means all the physical facts aren't enough to describe, uh, aren't enough to, let's say, um, amount to uh, an experience of red. So there's more to, uh, there's more to a, a red experience than uh, all the physical facts you could describe. Therefore, uh, red ex conscious experiences in general, if we generalize, are non-physical, they have some kind of non-physical nature. That's the conclusion. <laughs> so that's the Mary the Neuroscientist, argument, otherwise known as the knowledge argument. Because Akushti involves the idea that when Mary sees the red thing for the first time, she gains new knowledge. And what could that knowledge be if not uh, um, <coughs> so about some non-physical uh, fact? So that's the Mary the Neuroscientist, and it's, a, it's been a very powerful argument. I'm not going to um, uh, weigh, in on, uh, weigh in on it, I just wanted to describe it. Um, because this is published in 1982, I believe, at a follow-up paper in 1983, because so many people disagreed with it. It, it's one of the more controversial articles uh, in terms of the amount of people talking about it, but nobody could agree on why it's wrong. So there, are, there must be uh, five or six different uh, ways that people disagree with the, the, knowledge, the knowledge argument, and there's a lot of disagreement about where it goes wrong. Um, but. Um, but none of those people could agree amongst each other, people who disagree with the conclusion. So, definitely, it's not that this argument is thought to be a completely successful argument. Perhaps, in a way, unlike Ryle's category mistake argument, which is thought generally to be, I think, a successful uh, argument against dualism. So this argument in favor of dualism is not thought to be a lay-down arg argument for dualism. There are lots of responses you could make, but none of them are agreed upon as the right response. Uh, so the debate continues on that. So still you will, people, you will see people uh, debating, philosophers debating, uh, at least philosophers, about whether this argument works and more particularly why it doesn't work. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a thought experiment, maybe a more, one of the more well-known thought experiments. Um, I, um, it's worth being cautious, and one of the, one of the lessons, uh, one of the things people have said about this the Mary the Neuroscientist argument is, uh, not to, is to, be, to be aware of that thought experiments have limitations. So, for example, um, the, ex the thought experiment that I did earlier about the so-called Gettier case against the, the idea that knowledge is a justified true belief, uh, that is in a way unproblematic. I'm just I, I'm asking you to imagine that the clock is broken. <laughs> and that's a fairly simple thing for me to ask you to imagine. So whatever follows from that, we can take it as revealing something. But when I ask you to imagine 
uh, neuroscientist who knows everything <laughs> there is about the brain and how it works, then what, what exactly am I asking you to imagine? And can you really do that? Uh, is an um, interesting question. And some people have thought that it's not really possible uh, for you to imagine that. <laughs> you can imagine somebody saying that they know everything. You can imagine someone being regarded as knowing everything. But can you really imagine someone knowing everything? Uh, so thought experiments are, uh, have, have limitations. A thought have limitations. Um, nevertheless, uh, they're a key, a key part of the way philosophers do things. Okay, here, uh, here's just a, a problem that I thought I, I had to um, have to add in, um, and it's a little bit out of nowhere. But before we get on to more. Uh, hard and harder problems of consciousness. I wanted to just describe this problem because it's uh, related to various other problems and it's uh, um, rather a serious one. And it's called the problem of mental causation. And the, the problem is really that these three statements aren't, aren't uh, compatible. And no one can really figure out which one to throw away, or rather, um, they don't want to throw away any, maybe except for the third one. Um, okay, so here's the idea. The, this, uh, the idea is that physics is causally closed. But what that means is that uh, in order to, in some way, in order to account for um, um, Another way. Um, in order to account for what happens at the level of physics, you don't need to talk about the economics, for example. In that sense, physics is kind of separate from economics, right? It doesn't have. You don't need to talk about. Well, you know, these molecules are moving this way over here, but then interest rates went up, and so therefore. That kind of uh, 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 chain of causal reasoning doesn't happen in physics. Um, and the idea is that physics is just closed in terms of, closed off causally. It's its, its own um, kind of aut autonomous, I suppose you would say. In order to describe everything in physics, you only need physical forces. So take that as given. The second one uh, is that consciousness uh, has causal effects. So when you're conscious of something, that can cause something. Or you know, you do you um, you feel pain, and so you move your arm away from the fire. Let's say so. You're being conscious of the pain uh, caused that. Is something that we will uh, usually agree to, right? <coughs> The third one is a little bit trickier to explain, but it's the idea that um, so non-reductive uh, physicalism is the idea that um, that we we gain something by um, keeping mental vocabulary. That we couldn't, even, even in principle, we couldn't do without uh, talking about minds and consciousness and things above the physical. That um, there's a, um, a position in philosophy uh, that really, in some sense, uh, being conscious is just being in a certain kind of uh, brain state, let's say, or even just physical state. And there are others who, who uh, think that mental vocabulary is, or mental concepts are, and that they describe a part of the way the world is that would be uh, left out if you were to just reduce everything, talk about how the molecule, what the molecules are doing. Um, that there is something genuinely um, uh, 
new that gets added, new maybe not in terms of um, extra non-physical things, but extra properties of things that get, that get added in when you, um, that uh, make it somehow necessary or at least um, non-redundant to use mental vocabulary to talk about people seeing things and believing things and being conscious of things. But this actually adds something. Um, the consciousness um, itself, as, as such, has some effect. Uh, that's, broadly speaking, um, well, I, in fact, I've just pointed out the incompatibility, I suppose. So non-reductive physicalism is a popular idea like that, that we can't reduce mental vocabulary, mental terms, mental concepts down to just physical, you know, um, molecular terms. And so those, that, that idea doesn't sit very comfortably or perhaps it even is just incompatible with the, the first two, that physics is its own, was, in, at, the, at the level of physics things, things are um, um, sufficient to cause everything at the level of physics, let's say. So this is known as the, the problem of mental causation and um, I'm not trying to give a solution to it. I just wanted to point out that this is known to be a problem and it's a problem um, for uh, within consciousness as well because um, one of the things you get from the knowledge argument, so the Mary, the Mary the neuroscientist who knows everything at a physical level, right? She knows exactly how the molecules are acting and all that sort of thing. And therefore she knows what's going to happen next, if you like. Based on uh, just her knowledge of the brain, she's going to know what someone's going to say, right? So she will know that a person looking at a red thing for the first time is going to say, whoa, <laughs> what an amazing experience. I never had that before. She's going to know that much, right? So that means, uh, so in other words, at the level of, uh, you know, at a certain level, she's going to, um, she's going to, she has enough knowledge to describe everything that's going to happen physically, right? But, so if the argument, if the conclusion of the argument is right, that nevertheless there is something non-physical that she learns about, then that thing, whatever it is, can't, uh, can't be having any causal effects. <laughs> because uh, if there had not causal effects, she would, have, she would have somehow known about it, right? So, so here we have the problem in that, in that sense of mental causation. So if, if, knowledge, if the conclusion of the knowledge, knowledge argument is right, then this phenomenal quality of what it's like to see uh, is causally inert, as I say. And that's a problem. Um, okay, anyway, so more generally, there is the problem of mental causation. Uh, okay, so finally. <laughs> we get to uh, the hard problem, probably, probably, or now I'm not so sure. You might have heard of the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, this is made famous by Dave Chalmers in uh, his 1996 book. Uh, in fact, it was reading this book that propelled me on the, the research that I did for my PhD thesis. <coughs> Um, in, in some way in the opposite direction, I wanted to argue that the hard problem isn't so hard. <laughs> um, or at least isn't hard in the way that Dave Chalmers argued. Um, but it's, a, it's an important distinction to understand. So, in some way, I'm going to suggest this, am I going to suggest this here? Yes, you could think of the hard problem as being the philosophical problem, where we don't, we're not even confident that that the terms we're asking it are the right terms. Um, and we have a sense that we're maybe confusing ourselves with concepts. But at any rate, um, th by the easy problem, what Dave Chambers meant, and he certainly didn't mean to this to be insulting to people who are working on it, because he knows that they're very hard problems. This is the problem basically of how 
the brain works. Um, and what causes behavior, what causes us to do the things we, we do, um, how, how consciousness functions, as you would have said it. <coughs> so those things, we can, we, we, even if we don't know how to solve them now, we kind of know that it's, it's a, we'll, find, we'll find solutions. There is a kind of, in, incrementally we'll get there. We have some sort of confidence in that. The hard problem uh, is something that we don't have any confidence about, even that. So, the hard problem is the problem of the, uh, why, when I look at a red thing, I have this particular sensation. Why that sensation and not some other kind of sensation? Why is it reddish and not greenish? Why this is not that sensation? Or why no sensation? <coughs> Could there not be uh, creatures out there that are exactly like me, but uh, who don't have any sensations at all? They act as though they have sensations, but just they don't. There's just nothing happening. So, and if that can't be, then why not? <coughs> and that's known as the hard problem. In, in some way, I think that it's uh, maybe better to describe this as the, the philosophical problem, in the sense that we, we don't really we're not really confident that we know how to how to think about the problem. Um, but that's in a way my take on it. Re recently, and I understand yesterday there was talk about the the meta hard problem. Did someone here give that talk? This is a, a recent talk by Dave Cham a recent paper by Dave Chalmers, kind of extending this. So the meta problem, or me meta hard problem, hard meta problem, <laughs> the the meta problem. So this is the problem of why we even uh, are tempted to think that there is a hard problem, even if you think basically his idea is even if you think that there is no hard problem that it's not in the end problematic that uh, we, um, uh, that we, we, will, we will in some, will, if you think that there is someday we'll be able to figure out why we have a red sensation, particular sensation that we have when we look at a red thing, even if you think that somehow we'll be able to figure that out eventually, still, it has a different character than other problems. So, um, it seems trickier uh, somehow to know, to, to try to figure out why, let's say, why, why there can't be so-called uh, philosophical zombies. And so a philosophical zombie is uh, a thought experiment. So the, the idea is that, well, I guess I just described the thought experiment. We imagine somebody who has um, who is physically exactly like you are, but uh, is totally without any phenomenal consciousness. And if that seems possible, why does it seem possible? In a way, uh, even if it's in the end not possible, <coughs> there is still a problem of why it seems possible. And that's in a way the, the, the meta problem that David Chalmers is now talking about, uh, or has written about. Um, so the meta, um, I was going to say something else more there. The meta problem, um, I lost my train of thought on that one. If I think about it again, I will. Is, uh, is, is it a kind of uh, psychological one? Because you know, we are tempted to. Yeah, right. In a way, you can think of it, I think you can think of it as, um, um, but it's more like, um, yeah, so why do we think there's a problem? If you're asking why do we think anything, then that's kind of psychological question, right? But uh, the question, why is it more problematic? It might not be a psychological that, 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 that answer might not be psychological. 
Um, why is it harder to figure out? Why is it? Why does it seem possible? It might be not exactly just a psychological question, but it's definitely in that realm of um, what? Why do we? Yeah, you could say. And if we were to figure that one out, maybe this would be that would be uh, an advance. So why do we think that? There could be somebody who's physically like me, but totally uh, without any phenomenal conscious properties. Without any conscious, why do we even think that? If we, if we knew that answer to that, then uh, that would be, I think, uh, a solution to the meta problem. And maybe even by extension, a solution to the hard problem, but I don't know if that Dave Chalmers thinks of these as connected in that way. But the meta problem is that why why consciousness is different. In, in a way, it's the um, as, as you probably know, consciousness uh, uh, studies is very new, and uh, this uh, um, meeting is uh, part of a um, new movement, let's say, to study consciousness, and it was regarded as not kind of um, not le legitimate in a way for uh, decades. And so the meta problem could be thought of as, what is that? <laughs> What's different about consciousness that we think of it in this, this, kind, of, this kind of way? <clears throat> so what's different about consciousness uh, as opposed to all the other properties that we use? There's no problem about beliefs and desires and all these uh, mental terms have this relatively unproblematic features. We kind of feel like we can study them. Consciousness itself has a, um, a different character somehow. It seems harder, more um, harder to get a grip, grip on, harder to talk about, harder to know how to approach. That, in a way, the, the fact of that is, the, is, a, is a problem. <laughs> That's the meta problem, as I, as I understand. Um, so, Oh yes, I forgot actually how to define easy and hard problem. So this is in a way just uh, the way I think Dave Chalmers defines it. Understanding the new causes of behavior or would be the easy version and hard understanding why it's state has any particular meaning. Uh, and why any particular brain state has any particular phenomenology. So I already said this. Hopefully So, I just wanted to um, make an analogy at this point, actually. Uh, one thing that philosophers do often do is um, have a rather broad um, background. So, as a philosopher of mind, you might also be doing something like philosophy of language or ethics or some other rather broad area of philosophy. And that can be useful because sometimes you notice similarities, which you wonder if they're useful or not. So here's one kind of other uh, gap that um, I'll just describe it a bit. Now I'm going to kind of uh, leave it there. But So here is a David Hume, actually. It's a long quote, but I'll explain it a bit first. So there is a there's consciousness is not the only thing that we wonder if it's um, how to think about it. Um, there are other um, aspects of human life that we also wonder a lot about whether whether we've really got this the wrong way around somehow. And ethics is one of these. And meta ethics is the study of what is it to be ethically right, ethically wrong, good, bad, these kind of terms? What's the, um, what are they? Do they exist really? And this problem is not solved and is made particularly famous by David Hume, 18th century philosopher, who raised it in this context. I'll read it um, out but soon, but the idea is that um, it seems that we can have a, um, a complete description of the way the world is, and that description wouldn't tell us anything about 
the way the world should be, you know, how we should act, how we should behave, what's the right thing to do. It seems that we don't get that from uh, this kind of uh, description of how the world is. So let me just read Hume for you, um, and I'll talk about it a bit more. So this is Hume in 1738. Uh, saying this, so in every system of morality the author proceeds for some time in the ordinary way of reasoning and establishes the being of a god or makes observations concerning human affairs when of a sudden I am surprised to find that instead of the usual copulations of propositions is and is not I meet with no proposition that's not connected with an ought or an ought not this change is imperceptible, but it is, however, of the last consequence. Whereas this ought or ought not expresses some new relation or affirmation, it is necessary that it should be observed and explained, and at the same time that a reason should be given for what seems altogether inconceivable, how this new relation can be a deduction from the others which are entirely different from it. The distinction of vice and virtue is, found, is, found, is not founded merely on the relations of objects, nor is it perceived by reason. So, in a sense, Hume, Hume is talking about a kind of explanatory gap. What explains whether something is right or wrong? It seems like no, no, no description of the world can do that, because no description of something is the case can, can get you to what ought to be the case. Anyway, this is the Hume's raising of the, the problem of uh, the, the whole idea, in a sense, of right and wrong, is and ought, and where we get that from. We can even understand it as there, there being a kind of easy and hard, maybe even meta problem. So, we can easily understand the consequences of our actions. Um, well, I say easily. <laughs> we, can, we know how to understand the consequences of our actions. We, we can, uh, it's not particularly problematic to try to think about what's going to happen if I do this and this and this and this. We can, we can figure that out. Or it might be difficult, maybe sometimes in principle impossible, um, in practice impossible, but in principle we, we know how to do it. So, oops, sorry for the typing. Um, the hard problem for Hume is understanding understanding why we ought to bring about any particular one of those consequences. Why any of them are good or bad or whatever. So this seems, for Hume, there's a kind of a, just an unbridgeable gap between how things are and how they ought to be. And I say <laughs> that asterisk heart is supposed to be meta. <laughs> so there is a kind of meta problem there to be solved as well which is to understand why we're inclined to think of some experiences, good and bad, good and others, some consequences as good, others as bad at all. Why are we even inclined to think in that way? Uh, so that's a kind of meta problem. So, and I'm, I'm bringing this up uh, purely just to give a kind of analogy, uh, uh, which philosophers do sometimes do, to totally different fields, um, different areas of philosophy, just to try to Try to try to think through it if the solution of an of an, uh, solution of a problem in another area might help. But I wanted to just give you a, a flavour of that this is not the only part of philosophy where these kind of gaps exist. Um, okay, so let me take a short break, uh, like five minute break, because I'm then going to go into the harder problem. <laughs> so shall we take a break? Five minute break. Okay, <laughs> five minute break. Uh, come back at uh, well, like in five minutes. Hey John, uh, can, can yes. I can have a good, uh, I have a one question. Uh, oh yes. For going to harder problem. Yep. Yeah. In the earlier part of uh, uh, when you talk about, talk about, talk about the conceptual analysis, you know, uh, the, the conceptual analysis of con consciousness or consciousness conceptual analysis of water. Is it kind of uh, uh, dictionary definition or uh, everyday definition or something, or to, uh, yeah, um, because I, I, I had a similar argument. Yeah. 
by, by John, Sa John Santokawa that they start the uh, 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 question of consciousness. We, we got to start from uh, common sense definition of consciousness, not the analytical definition of consciousness. So that's something similar to it. So I want to know, I want to know more about the, what is exactly is conceptual analysis. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. Um, though I, I don't know, uh, so the idea that the analytic definition of consciousness and the common sense would be different sounds problematic to me. So what converge <laughs> or to be the same? I, that's, I don't quite know what's going on there. But um, yeah, what is it to analyze a concept? Um, there's a, um, I guess, well, we need to do it when we suspect, this is my idea, we need to do it uh, that when we suspect that we're talking at cross purposes with somebody and um, and that's causing us to not agree. <laughs> Let's say if we're, if, if you and I are disagreeing about, um, you know, whether, um, you know, whether I know um, something, then it might be that I'm using a different sense of know than you are, and that'll, and one way of solving that will be to uh, actually talk about, well, what do we mean by to know? And, and what, how you figure that out, what we mean by to know, um, is, so, well, one way is to go to the dictionary, but the dictionary is uh, just somebody's idea of how to swap the words for some other words, right? It might not be um, a very detailed or insightful um, 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 it might not give you, it might not help much in that sense. It might be just another word that means kind of the same thing, but you might not know what that means much either. Or at least the, the, the ambiguity might uh, be in that word too. So you might have to work harder to figure out uh, to separate out, if you like, what different things you could be meaning, or what we actually mean by this word. Um, I, I'm not sure this is helping. Um, Thank you very much. There was something else I was going to say there too. Oh, so, um, so I but Russell, I talked to you earlier about Russell and his idea that the, the, the present king of France um, Actually means uh, there is a there is a king of France and 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 Russell took that to be um, one of the things that well one of the things Russell seems to have been proud of is that he figured out the, the correct analysis of the word the <laughs> so uh, the the word the is um, a kind of something that we didn't really know before what it meant, although we use it all the time. You know, the king of France. For Russell, we, we, we use these words and we, um, uh, we communicate them, but we don't necessarily um, consciously think about how much we're communicating when we use these words. So, <coughs> the, the king of France. Well, if you say that, then you mean that there is a king of France. That's one of the things you mean. Um, and there are these things which are just part of our shared understanding and shared use of a word, but we just might not know uh, um, what that is, especially for a complicated word like consciousness. So how to do it? Well, uh, how to analyze the word? There, there are lots of ways. And now, uh, nowadays, we have the beginnings of um, uh, movement in philosophy called experimental philosophy, X by, and their idea is that um, this is a kind of empirical question actually. 
conceptual analysis is a kind of linguistic study. We need to do surveys and ask and uh, and uh, find out by uh, you know probing people, <laughs> testing, surveying, question hairs, all this what what people are meaning by it. And that can uh, often involve thought experiments. So what would you say in this case? And that's what we often ask ourselves. Um, and that's why thought experiments are really useful. We give a thought experiment and we ask, is this a case of knowledge, do you think? And the person, and person might respond saying, well, um, it doesn't really seem like it to me. I don't think they know in that case. Well, then that gives us some clue about uh, what we mean by a word like know. So um, that's, anyway. anyway, so that's an extended and rambling answer to your question, but I hope that it helps. <laughs> Yeah, conceptual analysis of the conversion. Is there any other questions that anybody had about the preceding? Yes, from Bosman. <laughs> yeah, um, Can you use the microphone? Um, I, I know that when Jackson proposed um, his Mavis Blue argument, uh, he is defending epiphenomenalism. I am not sure that the argument implies epiphenomenalism. That, uh, that part confused me a little bit. Yes. Can you explain that? Yes. Uh, I, I, um, I agree with you that there are many people who does, don't think that it implies uh, epiphenomenalism. That is, yeah, that, uh, that Qualio had no causal power. Um, but certainly the argument, the paper is called, well, no, not the paper. Is it the second paper? Which is called Epiphenomenal Qualia. That's the title of the paper. So at least at that time, Jackson thought that it implied epiphenomenalism. And uh, there are ways of getting out of that consequence, I know. Um, that would take us into really philosophical territory. <laughs> that maybe it's better not to uh, okay. go into. I'm interested in your ideas about why it doesn't. Um, but I, I totally agree with you that it's uh, not the. Many people take it that it doesn't doesn't imply a phenomenon. Although that's a problem, right? You have to somehow try to escape it uh, to escape that consequence. Anyway, that, that's the best I'll do now, but I'll, but I'll talk to you later about <laughs> philosophy to philosophy. Any other questions? Um, just one, quite, one quick question. Yeah. What do you think is the um, role of intuition? Oh, that's a great question. And the second question is, who's intuition? Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. I, I, didn't, I, I, did, I didn't even think till now that I left that off the, um, the, the methodology section. <laughs> intuition is not a methodology. I don't think it's actually a methodology. But uh, definitely, uh, um, so, so here is one. Um, Way that I think, um, well, there, I think, I think there are a couple of ways intuition is used in philosophy, and one of them is for uh, semantic questions, uh, where people will be asked, uh, kind of, well, um, you know, the clock stopped. You've just uh, look, the clock stop happens to be the right time of day that you look at it. You know, and. Uh, you'll say no. It doesn't. I don't think you know in that case. Just lucky. Um, and there you're using. A, it's a kind of. You might say semantic intuition. Um, that. <clears throat> but if other people have a different intuition, then we suddenly can't rely on intuition anymore, right? We have to choose some kind of uh, other way of figuring out the answer. And I, I think that's generally how we would have to approach things. So often intuition is a starting point. You, you, choose, you choose somewhere as, a, as a, a, a place that you can't necessarily defend, but that you think that um, 
it seems right to you and you can't really imagine other people uh, disagreeing. Uh, so you start there. Um, <coughs> and if someone disagrees with your starting point, you might say, oh, it was just intuitive to me. That was sort of an intuitive starting point. Uh, but you can't defend it and uh, you precisely cannot defend it. So if anyone disagrees, you have to find some other way of sol settling the question. But intuition is often used, to my mind, as a, as a starting point, like that. Um, and I think that's often misunderstood as, um, you know, you start from a premise that you think nobody else will object to. Um, but there are cases where somebody will ob object to that starting point and object on the basis that the person is merely having intuition um, and that's, uh, they have a different intuition. And it sounds like then there's a kind of argument of intuitions or clash of intuitions or something like that. But it's really just uh, a, a clash of what's a, a, an agreed upon starting point in that case. I think. And it's just, there's no shared intuition then that's not a good starting point. That's one case. Another case, uh, but the, the semantic case is a little bit different, I think. If I ask you um, what you, you know, you look at the clock, it's stopped, but it stopped at exactly the right time. So do you know the time uh, looking at that clock? And you say, um, sure, you know. And I say, and someone else says, no, you don't know that uh, in that case. In this case, the person who's, uh, um, uh, who has a different intuition um, um, maybe it's going to be confused by what you mean. And it will be because they, in a sense, meant a different thing by that word than you did. And in that case, it's in some way more serious because we're using words in different ways and we didn't realize it. And in that case, um, intuitions are, um, you know, in some ways, you know, we use words with some kind of expectation that other people understand the same thing that we do by them. And uh, words have meanings that we rely on, and rely on those meanings. And your understanding of the language, in a way, is just you're using intuition. And if other people mean different things by the words they say, well, you know, that's a serious kind of miscommunication issue, which of course, again, we have to settle. But it wouldn't be settled in, uh, automatically in a particular person's favor. Um, it would have to be some other way of just finding out uh, where, uh, where people are getting their intuitions from in that case. And and then uh, go from there. I don't know if that answers your question. I think behind this question, that there is this worry that um, lots of um, discussions in philosophy is based on intuition that's probably only shared by philosophers. That's only shared by philosophers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's um, uh, that's cruel. That kind. <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, I think in that case, of course, the intuition isn't reliable and shouldn't be relied on <laughs> in those cases, but there's more to say, I think, and it is that, um, um, philosophers are, um, do sometimes uh, use words in a technical sense, like phenomenology or qualia or something like this. And I think that they're not always aware, in a way that becomes part of their ordinary vocabulary, and feel like they have intuitions about its use, but it's, it, these words are actually technical and no one else has any intuitions about them. And that can happen just because you become part of a, I don't know, <laughs> Put it another way, um, what I was saying earlier about uh, intuition being a, just of a, an assumed shared starting point, let's say, um, it might be that among philosophers that, that they do arise, these assumed shared starting points, but they only arise among philosophers um, because of various uh, discussions that they've been having. And in the case where they're not shared about, uh, by others, yeah, that is a kind of serious problem, I think. Um, you get, particularly I think in philosophy, you get a lot of, I don't know, non-physicalistic kind of intuitions um, that are problematic, I think. Um, but, yes, I don't know. I, I totally take your point, and I think it probably does happen 
But I think that uh, um, one, one thing that I want to encourage is that when you do have it, a, 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 don't share the intuition that um, you should not think twice about saying it. <laughs> it's a, it, is an, it is an argument uh, that you don't share that intuition. Um, then you have to, the, the person you're talking to has to find some other way of settling the question. Um, and certainly, philosophers' intuitions are not particularly to be privileged. Uh, so I think that if they, um, if it seems that that's how the discussion is going, that the philosophy intuitions, because they're philosophers, they have special intuitions. That, that's definitely not the case, and I think that uh, if it looks like that's being assumed to be the case, then it's wrong, and you should be, feel free to disagree on the basis that you don't share the intuition. Does that help? <laughs> no. Are, are there any more questions? That's really, that's really, yeah. I didn't talk about intuitions, and it comes up a lot in philosophy. In fact, there are whole books about intuition, um, uh, which one could get into that. Um, are there any other questions before I push on with the last, the harder question? I think you might have to get up, Hashkin, and uh, or is, is the. Um, Could you, could you explain more about your thoughts on the relationship between scientific investigation and uh, conceptual analysis? Oh, scientific, uh, you mean the, the um, Jack Smart, uh, the water case that I, I right, went right. to earlier? I'll sign an example. Uh, could I explain my, my source? Yeah, so, thoughts. My thoughts, my thoughts, <laughs> my own thoughts. Um, um, Actually, I'm about to do that, in a way. Uh, so, in my explanation of a harder problem, I'm going to come back to that. So, that is a fantastic segue. Thanks very much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let me just do that. That'll allow me to get on with this, too. It's going to come up. Um, not exactly in that form, but in a related form. Uh, that hopefully will make it clearer. Okay, so let me explain the harder problem of consciousness. And I, I do think that this is uh, so named by Ned Block, um, and it's, uh, I do think that it's uh, more, uh, it's a harder problem. Um, and here it is. Okay, so the, the, the idea, the, the thing that we want um, out of a, a theory of consciousness is a theory that is not chauvinistic, that it doesn't apply just in the human case. Somehow, at least, we, um, as a starting point, imagine that consciousness is something that other kinds of beings could have, that we could create artificial consciousness, and you know, that doesn't have to have a brain. Um, and in order for, uh, so in order to think, think that, think that, we've got to think that, <coughs> think beyond the brain, if you like, because there's consciousness, we've got to think of a, a fully general theory uh, of uh, what, what is consciousness. And um, so in order to do that, what we need is uh, some, uh, we need to collect all the samples, <laughs> the representative, if you like. We need to know first, so what in the universe is conscious so that we can figure out what, uh, that they're having, what, what's the thing that they have in common. And that will presumably give us a general theory. Or at least that will be a starting point, right? Um, but in our case, uh, but well, in the case of consciousness, we, we only have ourselves that we know are conscious. And we know that by uh, introspection, so we, we know that we're conscious, because um, we, we feel the consciousness, if you like. So we know we're conscious. We can guess uh, that other things that are kind of like us are conscious. 
So, you know, animals which are sort of more like us, we're more likely to think that they're conscious. Um, and that seems to be based on just closeness to us. Um, but that's all. And, um, but that as a way of picking out what's conscious, just <laughs> similarity, to, similarity to us, seems like a really biased kind of way of picking out what's conscious in the world. Um, so we don't have a... We can't really be confident in that method of picking out what's conscious. And that means we don't have a way of um, even, even starting to um, be able to um, gather the materials to have a general theory of consciousness. So this is, this is the harder problem. Uh, Ned Block's harder problem. So I'm going to, that's the whole argument. I'm just going to go through it more step by step. So um, and here we get to the water case. So if I want to know what something is, we need a kind of a, a rule of thumb for picking it out in the first place. So let's say water. Um, you need a, or let's say I put it there, you need a kind of working definition. What's the phenomenon that you want to find out about? <laughs> and, if I go, right. <laughs> so, if you want to study water, you need to know, you know, at least in a rough and ready, rule of thumb, working definition kind of way. So, where, what is the water? Uh, so that I can get it and study it. Um, we know in the case of water, it's, you know, we can, we can say, you know, the top one, top two are water, the other two are not. Uh, we, we know that. Um, just by our use of the word. Uh, you just know what water is. That's a kind of purely um, knowing how to use the word water. We know that the top two are water, the other one are not. But we have a way of picking it out. Um, <laughs> this slide is a lot more visual. Um, okay, but so in the case of consciousness, We've only got one way of picking it out, for sure, and that's uh, your own case. You know you're conscious. Um, that's the only one that you know for sure is. Um, right. And this comes partly from uh, the idea that, well, what's consciousness? It's, it's um, it's something that, it's a state that it feels like to be in. It's, it's the state that, when we're thinking of Mary seeing red, redness for the first time, she has red experience. Well, that's what it is. Um, having that kind of thing. Um, it's got to feel like something. It's got to feel like something from the inside, let's say. Um, and if it doesn't, then you're not conscious. So in that sense, um, we have a way of picking it out, a very clear way of picking it out, but that only applies to us. And one individual is not really enough. Um, okay, so the other way of picking out is chauvinistic, the next premise. So this is actually um, um, an old problem. It's called the problem of other minds. How do we know that anything else has a mind? And one statement of this problem comes from 150 years ago. John Stuart Mill uh, wrote this kind of commonsensical um, and commonsensical um, answer to the problem by the mind. So how do you know other 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 human beings have minds? Well, he said, I conclude, other human beings have feelings like me because first they have bodies like me, which I know in my own case is the antecedent condition of feelings. And because, secondly, they exhibit the acts and other outward signs, which in my own case I know, by experience, to be caused by feelings. So, um, it's a kind of, uh, by, simil by outward similarity, we guess a kind of inward similarity. That's the idea. Or, um, but that doesn't allow you to rationally uh, conclude that in the case of something which is radically not like you, you can't really make any <coughs> any conclusions about how it feels uh, how it feels to be them. This is of course the problem of uh, Nagel's problem of the the bat, if you know that one. So.
So, <coughs> some, so because our, um, our let's say our, we're we're only entitled to think of things conscious that are like us because that's how we know consciousness. We just guess from a number of similarities, let's say. Similar, outward similarities imply some kind of um, general similarity, uh, which implies similarity of consciousness, uh, because it's just you know, uh, part of the general similarity. But something which is not like you in various ways, well, maybe they lack consciousness. <coughs> so there's no rational way to conclude anything not not like you uh, physically uh, is, is or isn't conscious. Okay, the next premise. Therefore, we have no confidence that we have a way of just picking out instances of consciousness in the general case. Uh, so, <coughs> the, neither method, so method meaning Neither, neither inward observation, no, neither introspection, nor um, by just uh, general similarity give us a way of ruling in or out creatures that are not similar. So Ned Block is, uh, in his paper, he talks about the case of uh, Commander Data from the Star Trek series in the next generation. Uh, it's, it's, it's from the 80s. I don't know if you've seen it. But at any rate, the thing about Commander Data in this series is that he's a character who is a robot, android, but his, his brain is, or rather, <laughs> what's in his head, is um, um, complicated and no one can figure out how it works, but it's very different from a brain. So no one, he's one of, he's one of a kind because he was built, uh, and then that person died and lost the plans, or something like that. And no one can figure out how it works. They only know that it, <laughs> it doesn't work like a brain works. But otherwise, he's just like us. So, um, so Bloch says, in this case, because, of, because it's so different inside, we can't use our ordinary way of telling whether uh, uh, of inferring from general similarity to similarity of consciousness as well. Because it might be one of the things, one of, it's, we know that there's dissimilarity in terms of um, you know, brain, uh, brain structure, so maybe consciousness is another way that's also dissimilar. How could we make that judgment? We, we, sim we simply cannot, is Bloch's uh, argument. And because we can't, we don't need, because we don't know whether commanded, commanded data in this is conscious or not, um, we, we don't know that fact. We can't use what we know about the structure of the brain, or data's brain. Uh, we can't fold that into our general theory of, of consciousness. So that we're sort of, we can't fold it in, <laughs> we can't, let's say, include that data as part of you know, the things which are conscious to come up with a general theory. But we also can't exclude it either. And therefore, we can't <coughs> begin to uh, make a general theory of consciousness. Um, or, right, any theory of consciousness has to be just a theory of what causes behavior. Uh, that's another conclusion that I particularly myself want to make. So forget about that one. So, this is a quote from this article called The Harder Problem of Consciousness. Um, and I'll probably end here, I think. So Bloch says, the root of this epistemic problem, this problem of knowing what's conscious, is that the example of a conscious creature on which the science of consciousness is inevitably based is us, but how can science based on us generalize to creatures that don't share our physical properties? It would seem that a form of physicalism that could embrace other creatures would have to be based on them at least in part in the first place. But that cannot be done unless we already know whether they're conscious. So that's the problem for a general theory which is not just about us, not just human consciousness, let's say, but consciousness in general. Um, I think, right.
we'll stop with the Turing test. <laughs> but maybe I for just about a, a time, I think. Does anybody have any? Is that right, if I said just two hours, right? No, uh, no, you can you can extend if you have something more. Oh well, not particularly. <laughs> I mean, uh, there is Turing test. Uh, let's not go to the Turing test. No, I think the harder problem is a good place to end it. <laughs> Does anybody have any uh, questions? <laughs> Keep in mind, this is a tutorial for scientists. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So the qualification. Uh, uh, to, to qualify to help mm, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, including me. Uh, so what's exactly the problem? Um, so I can think of two uh, two mean, kinds of. Uh, oh, did this working? So one problem yeah. there is that we don't know for sure whether a particular entity, like a robot or other kind of creature, is conscious or not. So yes or no questions. We, we don't know for sure, yes or no, the, 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 the yeah. entity is conscious or not. Yeah. That's one question. The other question is that um, even if we know for sure that that entity is conscious, we don't know for sure what kind of consciousness that entity has. So uh, the kind of consciousness. Yeah, so the, the bat so you talk about bat, yeah. so the um the Nagels. So I mean I think that typical philosophers, including Nagel, assumes uh, assume that the bat is conscious, the, the bats have are having some kind of conscious experience when when they, they are reacting to the the Uto sound or something. Yes. So, so let's assume for sure that we uh, we are certain that the bats are having some kind of conscious experience there. The question then is, like, but we don't know, uh, we can't imagine what kind of conscious experience they are having. So that's the, that's another problem, right? So yeah, because if, if you want to if you want to have a general theory of consciousness. Then we want to we want to look at all the, the cases, all the variations of consciousness, right. and see what what's really common, what's really different. Yeah. But as long as we are not able to imagine what it is like to be a bat, then you know, even if we know for sure that they're conscious, yeah. still we have a problem. So there are two different kinds yeah. of problems. Yeah, they're definitely different. Um, thanks for uh, bringing that up. Yeah, I I don't know that. Block in this article or elsewhere talks about that particular problem of kinds of consciousness. It, um, and I wonder if this is, oh, I don't know. No, anyway, he doesn't, he doesn't talk about kinds of consciousness, more of just a whether or not. Um, and that's what he thinks is the, the thing that we particularly lack, just whether or not something is conscious. Maybe if we knew that is conscious, we could get some idea about the kind of consciousness from the, you know, what, 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 what's being represented or something like that. Probably Bloch doesn't go, wouldn't say that. But at least it would be something. But we don't know, yeah. We don't, we don't neither uh, whether anything, of anything, <laughs> whether it's conscious or not. And uh, we also don't know, I mean, almost uh, follows. We also don't know what kind of consciousness it has given you. Uh, yeah, both of those things. I'll just say both of those things. Any more, any more questions? Then. Yeah. Uh, uh, so in this afternoon we have we have a debate session. So Bay, right? how can you relate this? Question, uh, uh, question for the, the session one, how to collaborate. Right. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know that there's this debate, um, debates happening in the afternoon, right? Between uh, whether philosophy is useful for a scientist and the other way around. Um, I don't, actually don't have any thoughts I want to put forward here about it. Uh, it's a really interesting question. I could just wait until the debate uh, to talk about that. Um, yeah, in some ways I think of them as different problems. There are philosophical problems and then there are scientific problems. It's partly how I divided up the hard and easy problem into the, the scientific problem and the philosophical one. Um, 
whether that's the end, but that implies no collaboration. So that sounds pessimistic. <laughs> but I don't wanna I don't wanna be pessimistic with this meeting. Um, and it must not be the end of the story, because I know that there is in fact a lot of fruitful collaboration between philosophers and scientists. Um, and partly but partly I do think that uh, so philosophical problems are um, everywhere. Um, and philosophical problems are often um, confusions, fallacies, uh, ambiguities, uh, all of these things that philosophers spend their uh, time dealing with and which they think of as often the main problem to deal with. Uh, those things are everywhere and particularly in a, a field like consciousness studies where there's so much uncertainty about um, the terms and the concepts being used that philosophers have got to be useful there. Um, um, but yeah, maybe I'll, I should just leave it there. So the debate, the debate is starting Welcome. at one thirty, and until then, there's nothing. Uh, uh, so it's in two uh, hours. Three p.m. Okay. All right. So um, uh, anyway, I'll be around then uh, for the debate as well. So feel free to come and uh, grill me or disagree with me uh, in the meantime. And um, thanks very much for your attention.